proprio che poi anch'io me lo sentire la, la pubblico e metto pubblico eh, questo è il ultimo appuntamento di questi 11 giorni che a questo punto posso anche io sono stati abbastanza faticosi e però sono molto contento perché insomma stanno mi sembra che siano stati veramente dei giorni di dialoghi molto fruttuosi. Abbiamo oggi un altro esempio di questo desiderio di eh, mettere insieme discipline diverse, eh, è un esempio cui tengo molto perché appunto c'è uno scrittore italiano, eh, diciamo della mia generazione, più giovane, Vincenzo Latronico, che si occupa anche molto di arte e quindi è una diciamo, prova vivente che eh, le discipline possono convivere unicamente, anche se a volte con difficoltà, come sicuramente anche lui sa bene, soprattutto difficoltà per il mondo esterno. E, e Marco Livio Guarè che ha fatto un'istituzione super multidisciplinare, come sapete che è il parere di Tokyo, di Tokyo in cui l'arte era, eh, era veramente il centro, ma un centro prontamente, selvaggiamente, eh, diciamo, pronto appunto a dialogare con eh, lui tra so che sta mettendo in piedi una nuova istituzione per cui questo forse sarà anche interessante eh, chiedere e eh, dialogare con lui su questo comunque loro due si sono preparati eh, sono molto curioso di quello che verrà fuori a me piace molto diciamo, curare queste cose essendo anch'io curioso di quello che verrà fuori perché se no diventa tutto troppo prevedibile quindi grazie a Vincenza Marco Rivier grazie a voi di essere qua nonostante il caldo e benvenuti cominciamo grazie Personally, I always find quite uh, um, quite complicated the, the 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 question about the gray area or the boundaries or the collaboration between uh, different disciplines, uh, and this is even harder to define when this thing is actually possible and uh, has happened, such as uh, in the program of the Ballet And yet, when I think of the of the collaboration of the sort of superimposition between art and science, at least from the from the point of view of, of a writer, as a, uh, as I, I am, as Gianluigi said, the, the so the point of view of literature, I think that one of the things that art and science would have in common, quite paradoxically, is uh, their strange relationship or their partial relationship to the public's awareness. This is something that uh, I was also discussing before with uh, Patrizia Sandretta Rodegar Host. Uh, the fact that, uh, for instance, when you, if you take a copy of the Corriere della Sera or of Le Monde, you would find uh, several pages uh, discussing literature, discussing contemporary novels, discussing literary prizes even, and very rarely would you find anything uh, uh, about contemporary art, discussing contemporary art in depth. Uh, critically, as uh, they might discuss a novel. Perhaps you find uh, a single article, in, usually in the society area, that discusses some like, um, debate or some uh, scandal that there has been around the price of painting by Macrocco or around uh, the cost of an installation by Maurizio Catalan in Italy, for instance. And this is just uh, where it stops. Like, a very interesting case has been in Germany recently uh, um, There, uh, a book came out, I think it was six or seven years ago, which was called Le Bienveillant, Le Benevole, by Jonathan Lottel, whose uh, it came out in French, the main character was a Nazi officer. Uh, and when the book came out in Germany, there was a huge scandal that went on for weeks and months in which like, intellectuals, writers, politicians debated about the way that this book portrayed Nazism. Recently in Germany there has been the, the Berlin Biennial, which uh, some of whose works tackled exactly the same issues. What is left of Nazism in contemporary German society? Uh, how can we relate to that? And yet it has never been discussed seriously. You know, if, if you see it on the newspapers, it was just seen as a provocation, as uh, like someone who just wanted to raise attention on themselves. And in a way, this is a bit the same um, thing that happened to science. If you look at the same copy of the, of the Corriere della Sera or of Le Monde, Uh, you will very rarely find an in mean, depth discussion of a scientific discovery of, or of a new theory or of a debate. What you find, I think, what everyone can remember is the discussion of how much it costs for the taxpayers' money 
uh, this last experiment that they did uh, uh, in, uh, in Switzerland, or the risk that this would generate a black hole and uh, that would devour the whole planet. But very seldom, you know, it's treated as something that can matter to everyone. And so, I know perhaps this is a bit uh, uh, a provocation itself, but don't you think that one of the things that we could say or the things that art and science have in common is that they're put like in the last row of the class, you know, is that they're the pupils that we don't really want to hear about. Yeah, in a way, you're right, uh, you're right. Uh, I was just thinking about, um, I don't know if it's like culturally, or speaking about Italy, uh, um, France, in a way, Germany. Uh, we speak about art, in, and as you say, we speak about art in newspapers, but maybe not the way we want it. You know, we speak a lot about art, uh, when it comes to Biennale, when it comes to art fairs, when it comes to what we could say, uh, which is now, I think, unfortunately, I think this is my opinion, of course, this could be debated. Uh, my opinion is like more and more we shifted from uh, an art which could be described as exhibition oriented art. You know, like you go in the museum and you see an exhibition, which means a composition of artworks uh, which makes a medium which is called exhibition. And more and more we shifted to another type of, I mean, a way of, not another not type of art, but another way of uh, showing art, which is maybe not the exhibition, but events, which means a lot. An event is a is, is the is the point, a precise point in time and space. You know, you can you can focus on it, and it's very easy to describe it. And I think for the for for the media, for our society, the way we describe things is very convenient. You speak about the Biennale, you speak about an art fair, and now we can even think about how to describe an exhibition, which became. Uh, more and more an event. So I think, uh, I don't know where it leads us, but uh, uh, having shift from exhi exhibition-oriented art to an, an event-oriented art uh, helped, in a way, art uh, in the media. It helped uh, being more popular, which means we could talk about it in terms of prices, to talk, talk about it in terms of uh, of rumors and gossips and, and you know things you can talk in newspaper and it helped in a way of popularizing art because you know, like I think more and more people are, uh, know things and I say things uh, uh, about art uh, which means I mean it's it's already maybe a starter or at least it's something because you know like. 20 or 30 years ago, there would be no one would talk about art, and no one would would even like go in a in a, in a Kunsthalle. I remember like uh, Hans Zeman uh, told in a, in a newspaper once that uh, when exhibition became form, become form, uh, he, he had a Kunsthalle Berlin when he sees the exhibition, which is considered by the specialist as one of the uh, exhibitions which started the, the modernity of exhibition at the Ausstellungsmacher as a curator, as someone who is uh, like an artist organizing a medium which is called exhibition. I mean, there was a lot of people at the opening because it was always the, 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 the same people going from one exhibition to another. But in terms of frequency, uh, for audience, maybe it was like at least maybe maybe not even more than 1,000 people in, in two months. Huh? And now, of course, at Palais de Tokyo, for example, we, we have like 200,000, 300,000 people for contemporary. And document, I think they expect uh, around 1 million people. So it's a little bit of a paradox. Uh, more and more people are interested in art. More, uh, you got, uh, it's easier and easier to get uh, private money. Because, you know, like, uh, people think uh, it's a, an art is a, is a place where you can invest your money. And uh, so it, it seems from the outside everything is going good for the art. You know, you're an artist, oh, you should be successful. There's so much money around and it's, it's great for the right, time, the, the right time to be an artist. 
but it concerns a certain way of looking at and talking about art. And this is very important uh, because we're talking about a very specific area of art uh, which shifted from, as I said, an, an exhibition to an event. What does it mean? I don't know. It helps us to talk about art, but the language we use is maybe not the one we want it, we want to, to, to use for ourselves. Yes, and this is, this is really the point, I think, because I don't know how it is in, in, uh, in France, for instance, but in Italy, uh, and uh, just as we were saying before, um, through schooling, through basic schooling, you absorb a lot of the categories that are needed to understand, for instance, literature. So the point of the, the, the like the point of view of the writer is, in a way, a privileged one because uh, everyone, or almost everyone, who has gone through mandatory schooling will at least know grammar and syntax. So he will be able to understand whether a book that he, he or she has in front of uh, uh, is whether it is well written or not well written. Maybe you know, uh, then it's a boring book or a simplistic book and it has a lot of success. But at the same time. Almost everyone is able to tell whether a book is grammatical or not. Whether, whereas uh, this really does not hold for contemporary art, I think that it's very hard if you put like an extremely, extremely bad, just a passerby who has gone through mandatory schooling. I think they they really lack the categories and the language to understand what is wrong with this work. Um, and I think that this, you know, also relates to something else. And uh, uh, that, like, there's a very interesting phenomenon that I think that is very revelatory of this. Um, imagine that uh, there's just been uh, the Cannes Festival and uh, you know the films are just arrived in town so more or less all newspapers start speaking about it, they're writing about these films and people start watching them and so you meet a friend uh, uh, after dinner and you say oh have you seen the new film by Michael Haneke and he says oh no really I don't understand contemporary cinema <laughs> like that's you know that, that would, or have you seen Batman no no I don't understand contemporary cinema you know there's nothing it's, of course you understand there's, it would be ridiculous, it would be a, a joke if you said something like that. But then, if you on the other hand you say, have you seen the uh, latest exhibition by like something like Batman, like Daniel Hurst? Have you seen the latest exhibition by Daniel Hurst? No, no, I really don't understand contemporary art. That's something, that's a reaction that you accept. That's a, or at least that you, a reaction that is socially acceptable, that uh, does not strike us as completely out of the, of, of the range. And I think that the same, curiously enough, the same kind of uh, answer that is accept acceptable of, about mathematics, say. Like, mathematics is one of the only branches of knowledge and culture of which people can be proud of not understanding, at least in Italy, I don't know about in France, but in Italy, many people say, like, uh, uh, do you, like, do you, have you seen this, this theorem? And say, oh, no, 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 I never understood anything about mathematics, you know, and they say it in a way that, with a sort of, of pride, that, that nobody would say, for instance, of a symphony. If you see, do you, have you heard the symphony by Mozart? They say, maybe one would say, you know, like trying to justify themselves. Uh, oh, you know, I don't really understand contemporary, like classical music. But not with the pride and like the sort of indignant uh, uh, reaction that uh, mathematics is able to, to elicit. And perhaps also some kind of science. People say uh, string theory or quantum the uh, physics. And it's something that people can feel at ease being completely ignorant of. Whereas uh, with music, for instance, not like this, and I think also with, uh, with contemporary art, it's very strange. I don't know why, but... Uh... Yeah, but uh, and, uh, this is uh, interesting. It's uh, about keys, I guess. Keys of lecture, keys of interpretation. I think, maybe I'm wrong, but I have the feeling now everyone understands Monet or, or understands Mondrian, for example, because of L'Oréal, you know? I mean, everyone is like aware of uh, <laughs> these colors and, and, and geometry and structures and... And if you do an exhibition about Mondrian, well, I know at least Monet, let's say. Everyone will go there and understand. I mean, Impressionism now is, is you know, like everyone has the keys of reading uh, uh, Monet. Maybe not Mondrian, maybe they, you know, like through a certain filter. And but this is maybe a little bit scary of what I'm like, just brainstorming. It means uh, that in literature they have the keys. Uh, but what keys are we talking about? Uh, is the keys of literature we have are the same the same keys we had like in the twenties at the same time of impressionism? And if if we read really contemporary literature, 
we, we won't understand it, or we, we understand as we would understand the contemporary art uh, if we have the keys, uh, like contemporary music. Uh, you know, you, you remember like in the 60s when it's like hardcore contemporary music. Uh, of course, you know, if you don't have the keys, it's impossible to understand. I spent six years in the United States, I have a very good friend who explained me baseball rules, uh, and I can tell you I still don't understand it. Uh, and it's, you know, like it's, it seems that it's not so complicated, but uh, uh, I don't know. If we, uh, do we, I mean, can we, if, if, we, if, we, if we say we can enjoy literature and cinema, does it mean we have the keys, uh, which are the, the keys of contemporary cinema and contemporary literature? I don't know. I just uh, I don't, no. My idea was just about a perceived uh, position of uh, this area. Of course, like uh, true, some truly contemporary literature is totally ununderstandable to the general public or even to myself, like uh, but or to but uh, but, but uh, at the same time the, the or even to specialists. But at the same time, mm, I think that in the way this discipline is perceived with respect to culture is <coughs> something that is very close. Um, perhaps wrongly so, but perhaps just because of education. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, and you know, it's strange what you said about L'Oréal. It made me think that uh, maybe the same is true about uh, like uh, radio frequencies uh, uh, after people started uh, having Wi-Fi or cell phones. You know, there, there are some scientific discoveries that just when they're mediated through an applied applied technology, people can sort of relate to. Perhaps I don't know if uh, like the existence of radiations or, or, or some kind of, of um, structure of the atom has become suddenly more tangible after uh, the development of the atom bomb, whereas when this was studied just a few decades before, purely theoretically, of course it hadn't really penetrated the, 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 um, like the consensus. I don't know, if I, uh, but it would be interesting to understand. Yeah. 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 No, I think I would also remember, to go back to, to the theme of uh, uh, success in say, uh, literature and media and public understanding, I was talking with uh, Christopher Priest, I don't know if you know this writer, he's the one who wrote The Prestige and it was this famous uh, um, film by Christopher Nolan about two magicians uh, trying to compete to find the best uh, magic trick um, and I mean, Christopher Priest is, a is one of the most famous uh, 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 science fiction writer in the world and I, I made an interview with him and he said like Oh, you know, I envy you. You, you're from France, from France, or at least you live in France. And you know, in France, the writers have so much respect. You see them everywhere in the newspaper, on the television, and uh, is it, isn't it the same in, in London? Or in Britain? Oh, no, no, no. The writer is never uh, ask, uh, never. Uh, no one asking his opinion. He's never on television and. Like, who are the artists? You know what I'm <laughs> the artists are everywhere. And uh, he was like, kind of like, you know, like David Hurst and all these people like making the big hit in newspaper and television and uh, the philosophers and writers, and they're, they're not so popular as they, they are in France, for example. So I was I'm wondering if it's his way of seeing it uh, or it depends on which culture we, we, we are. I don't know. I mean, of course, Italy and France, I think, uh, at least the journalists are coming more from literature. Yeah. And whereas in Great Britain, I don't know where they come from, but uh, maybe the image is, is, has more uh, weight or. I don't know. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that I must have for, forgotten to, to specify that, uh, of course, this kind of discourse, and strangely enough, there too, the. Uh, in the UK, but I think also in the US, uh, both the position of the, the artist and of the of mathematics within general culture are quite different from the way they are in Italy. I don't know about France, I know that in Italy this responsibility has largely to do with the one big reform of education that has been carried out under fascism, the uh, gentile reform that incorporated the philosophy of Benedetto Croce that uh, really structured the hierarchy of, the, of knowledge in which humanistic knowledge, uh, literature and philosophy was at the top and uh, um, technical, so-called technical knowledge including mathematics, physics and the like were at the service of, uh, 
of these other disciplines. So <coughs> I, I wouldn't know how in the rest of the world this evolved, but it's strange that what you pointed out is that in the same countries in which uh, the artist has a more important role, at least in the public opinion, than the writer, are also the ones in which uh, the relationship to mathematics and technology is uh, more, uh, I would not say this involved, I would not say that in English, uh, like uh, more flirtatious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and, 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 no. but, uh, and about the interview that you did with Christopher Priest, actually, there's, there's this other thing that I have read the, the, a piece of that interview in a, in a conversation that you did with Alexander Singh, and there was also something that I wanted the, to get to uh, the thing about the the, um, the working of, of magic and the prestige and the way it relates to contemporary art. Mm -hmm. Could, how, how, how did it work? What was it that you said? I remember that. Uh, the, the, what, what do you want to mean? The, the, I remember that uh, in that interview, uh, uh -huh. Chris mentioned something about uh, the working of a magical trick that you relate to. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, something very obvious. You know, I say, like, of course, a uh, magic trick, if you want the magic trick to work, you know, um, it has to be, you have to believe it. You know, sounds obvious. For example, it's only like, of course, you know, I'm in conversation with you, uh, and by, like, uh, why I'm talking to you, I just uh, take a rabbit out of my bag, for example. And you say like, yeah, I'm just a rabbit, you took a rabbit out of your, out of your hat, and it's not so, you know, like, uh, surprising. But if I tell you, you know, it's impossible that in my bag there is a rabbit, you know, I can show you, and it's impossible, and, but against all odds, I will take a rabbit out of my bag. And then you will say, that's amazing, how did you do that, how did you do that? You know, that it's just a question of how you phrase it and how you make people believe. And I think in art, uh, it's really the same. And this is my big interest in art. I come more from philosophy. And I always, I you mean, know, my first encounter with contemporary art you know, was this great mystery that, uh, you know, like almost a century ago, a guy uh, went in a, in a the supermarket came out with an object and say, oh, this is this is an, art, an artwork, you know, like how an object, the ordinary object, uh, is getting transfigured into an art object. Uh, now we, we know a little bit how it works, uh, but it's still a big mystery because we still don't know how the transfiguration is done. But basically, you know, like it's you have to believe it. It's like the same story as the bread becoming, uh, you know. You know uh, like wine becoming blood, let's say. You, know, like it's, you have to believe it. It's a transfiguration that means something, and your eyes see something else. You know? And that's that's very interesting because it, in the magic trick, uh, uh, the magic trick function a little bit in the same way. And I think uh, Christopher Priest, while talking about magic, uh, tells a lot about how an artwork would uh, function. For example, it's every, I don't know if you, if you remember this or if you saw this uh, movie, which is not a great movie, but it, the, the book is great. And every magic trick has three steps. The first step, the first stage, uh, is called, uh, I, have to, uh, I have to remember exactly. The presentation. The, 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 the pledge. Uh, yeah. That's cool. It's where you present the thing, for example, a cage with a bird inside. And uh, the second stage is called the turn. So it's where you make things disappear. For example, you put a piece of fabric on the cage and then you say abracadabra, you, you like uh, punch a little bit the, the cage and then you take out the, the, the piece of fabric and there's nothing, everything disappeared. You know, like no cage, no words. So everyone is like, whoa, this is about uh, disappearance. And the third stage and is the, you know, like, uh, uh, the stage which makes a great magician, or not a, such a great magician, it's called the prestige. It's where uh, one of the things which disappear, disappeared, reappear. For example, the bird that come out of your pocket. And everyone is like, "Wow, oh, that's amazing! It's fantastic!" And I didn't expect that, and, and so on. And in a way, you know, you 
this is where my interest lies. Like, I will tell you a little bit, a few words about that. Uh, why I'm so interested, for example, in magic or in science, or uh, because you know, like it, this is a uh, a grid of interpretation. You know, you have three stages of uh, of doing things, and uh, in a way, you know, like if you think about the artwork, working and living the same way. You know, like you present a thing. This is just a glass. You know, and then, basically, if you want to see it as an artwork, you have to make it disappear as an object and reappear as an artwork. And now we do it because we are used to it. You know, like it has been more, almost a century that we have been told that all the new objects could be transformed into art objects. Of course, you have to respect some rules. But we do it almost immediately, which is good. It's even better than in magic. It's like even ten times more difficult than in magic because in magic the, the tricks, the two, the two guys, the two friends, you know, like compete uh, each other to find the best magic, and one is finding the ultimate trick, uh, which is the transported man. The transported man is a guy on stage, uh, take a door, and immediately reappear at the other side of the stage. This is impossible. I mean, he, he cannot like take a stage, disappear, run under the stage and reappear like 20 meters away in, instantly. It's, it's, it's not possible. So, you know, it's something for your mind uh, uh, that's that mind-blowing in, in, in a way. So, uh, he disappear, reappear, but not you know, like at the same place, of course, because uh, otherwise we say, what? No, that would be funny actually if you reappear the same place. But uh, so he has to do some performance, so he will be 20 meters uh, away. But the artwork, I mean, it's even more amazing because you know, he disappear, reappear at the same place. And we are like, wow, it's amazing, but it's still the same object, uh, it didn't move. But we are amazed uh, to see this transfiguration, and uh, on, in, on a philosophical way, it's very important, I think, uh, because if in order to see an, an ordinary object, you have to accept the what we call, you know, like philosophically, the reality, you know, like reality philosophy, in a way, you know, like objective uh, philosophy, and in order to see it uh, as uh, an artwork, you have also to accept the idea philosophy, this kind of like other side of philosophy. And in order to see it as a, a, a functioning artwork, you have to accept and, 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 uh, and, uh, and fuse the two sides, reality philosophy and idea philosophy, in order to see an artwork. And this interests me, because it's not so much the artwork, of course you will see an object which is nothing to see, basically. It's what lies behind, and in order to explain it, you cannot explain it like this. I mean, uh, lady, I mean, like uh, armies of art critics, philosophers, and art historians tried uh, during last century to explain why an artwork became an artwork, and it's. Uh, the, I think it's a kind of failure because no one could really explain it. I mean, we know there is like four. Condition: you, you need to have something to see, you need to have someone who does it, uh, who makes it. Uh, you have to, to have some, or at least someone who sees it, uh, a third party. And uh, that's where things are getting more complicated. Uh, you have like a four, uh, fourth condition, maybe you know, like a, some, something that makes the, third, the three conditions work together. Uh, the institution, the authority, the, the logic, this is an artwork, uh, the performative, etc. etc. Then, you know, like we don't know, we start to find, we to find which is the, the right fourth condition. And I think the, the, the people who explain it the best is, is like Christopher Priest. Huh? You know, he said, like, every magic trick has three stages. Of course, you don't explain. Huh? What is at stake? But you say something which is in the margin, and I'm very interested in, for example, in Palais de Tokyo. Uh, during six years, every Thursday, we had like uh, uh, talks, uh, 
uh, lectures. And I never invited an art critic or an art historian. I always invited someone to talk about uh, quantum physics or string theory, but like uh, military strategy, yodeling, uh, Tour de France, uh, science fiction, etc., etc. Because, you know, like it's through the margin. I mean, like, like Godard said, it's always good to quote Godard, you know, because it makes me be smart. I don't know, I mean, Godard is smart. He said, like, the margins hold the lines. And I think it is, this is smart, I think, because you, you see that uh, it's going through the margin, that going through the margin, you, you, f you can find a little bit uh, more solution than if you just stay uh, on the lines. So that's my interest, trying to find, like, to, to, to go outside the, the, the art language, uh, to find uh, schemes of interpretation, a way of looking at things that explain what is at stake in this, in this field of knowledge. And, and once you have like proper interpretation to see what's, what, you, what is at stake in this field of knowledge, trying to transfer this scheme of interpretation and see how it works in the art world. And this is, I think, it's important. I just finished this yeah. small thing. I think it's very important. I mean, why is it important? It's just a question of language. And I think, uh, um, for me, it's, it's crucial. Uh, it's crucial to notice that in the art world, and then this brings us back to science, uh, um, the, in the art world, I mean, the art world is like analyzed by art critic and art historian, which means by people who master a language which was uh, formalized by the art world by itself, you know, like internally uh, uh, formalized. So, uh, can an institution be analyzed by its uh, the language it created? I don't think in science it's possible. I don't think in science if you want to analyze an object, you, you, you have to step back and trying to find the right language that helps you to analyze an object in an objective way, not the, uh, not the, the language which was, uh, uh, which was like uh, mastered and which was like uh, formalized by the field of knowledge you want to analyze. You know, it seems obvious to say it like that, uh, but if you think in, in the art world, uh, I mean, how to analyze a museum by, uh, with the, how to analyze a museum with the language developed by the museum people? I mean, said like that, it doesn't seem so smart, but it's what is happening uh, every time, everywhere in the art world. So I think it's very necessary to, to try to find other way of looking at, you know, other way of speaking, other way of I mean, talking about things and trying to, that's why, for example, trying to use the language of science fiction, trying to use the language of uh, some science or literature or whatever, and, and then trying to analyze what is at stake in the art world. It's, um, it's very interesting that you uh, get to this because this is exactly, I think, the, the crucial issue here. And, uh, in a way, it's also, uh, it also risks being a problem. Like, I remember exactly in Turin a couple of years ago, there was a panel that had to do with something in a way similar with the uh, relationship between literature and, uh, and contemporary art. I, I was sitting on that panel, and uh, the, at some point, uh, um, the critic uh, and curator called Dita Rostrete said that um, mm, contemporary art has become uh, the refugee camp for experimental practices because basically it is so. Uh, hungry or in need of uh, marginal discourses, of external languages, exactly for this same reason, that it accepts whatever it can get. So that, uh, uh, in Dieter's uh, point, most uh, experimental filmmaking, most experimental literature uh, had uh, now found its home in the contemporary art field because those practices had been expelled by the market from the area in which they were originally developed. So experimental filmmakers are no longer shown in cinemas, but they're shown in exhibitions. And yet at the same time, I think that this 
can be a risk, and it could be, especially if, uh, in, when it comes to art and science. Uh, and I think that what you've been doing at Palito is really exemplary of how to do these things, but it's also pretty rare, I think. That very often it's also a legitimation. You know, as an artist, if you involve another practice, especially an abstruse practice such as, you know, contemporary poetry or string theory, that people think it's like something far that they don't understand, it's sort of very legitimizing. You know, you say, okay, I'm doing something that is very abstruse, <coughs> that you're going, that this is important, that this is uh, mm, like deep, and uh, they usually, it's almost a conceptual gesture of wanting to put the brand of uh, science or of poetry or experimental film on an art project or object and, uh, and maybe get some uh, uh, prestige or some importance from it. I don't know if we are allowed to say uh, bad things about pro uh, artworks, but in this respect I think that um, it's very interesting to parallel the, the need uh, or the invitation of uh, uh, quantum uh, f physicists uh, and string theorists to speak at Bel Tokyo with a project uh, by Jordan Wolfson had I think for, for Freeze project a few years ago we talked about it, uh, mm, before it was uh, basically he invited uh, uh, I think it was uh, a specialist in string theory to give uh, lectures in string theory to the public like walking around the Freeze Art Fair as if it were um, a guided tour of the, the art fair, but as a matter of fact, was a, a very complicated physics lecture that the public was not expected to understand in a way that was meant, I think, to underline how the critical discourse of contemporary art also is abstruse and complicated to understand, which I think is a point. But then one says, what is the role of science here? Like, is it really important that this uh, science that is being taught and explained in this context is uh, uh, well researched? is uh, f founded, is grounded, is it considered as a part of culture, is it considered as knowledge? And of course it is not, it's just a token. It's there to represent something else, to represent something abstruse, a bit like in uh, uh, advertisements or in cheap movies. Uh, people are portrayed with like glasses and white uh, uh, shirts in order, no, not shirts, uh, like white overcoat to um, like look as if they were um, trustworthy, you know, because they're it's like an image of science, and I think that this really is a risk very often, you know, like uh, the, this uh, piece that is accompanying us, it is a piece by this artist, Tori Johansen, and she really works, I think, on this, uh, uh, on, this thing, on the aspect of science. This is actually not scientific at all, this is uh, a linguistic computation of the occurrence of a certain term in the fields, but if anyone who sees this just sees science written all over it. And it doesn't matter whether it is good or bad science, whether it makes sense or not. It's just, you know, something that we are used to associating to a certain set of feelings, just as we associate the smell of fresh bread to uh, the, area of some, the, the aura of something genuine. And so, like, uh, McDonald's uh, uh, uses fake odors in order to make people believe that they're actually cooking things, you know? Mm -hmm. I think it you mentioned a, a very important point, uh, this kind of seriousness and I think, you know, you remember the 80s and 90s where in order to be serious, you know, you had to quote Derrida and Foucault and Deleuze and uh, otherwise you just passed as being like a dumb guy, just an artist, you know, like who smelled a, 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 a terrible thing, you know, in his, work, in his uh, studio and uh, um, now I think science replaced a little bit uh, Foucault, Deleuze, and, uh, and people still don't understand the world of, of it, of course, but it's, it's good, it's good, it, it's serious, it's, it's impressive, and, and I don't know, I, you know, at Documenta, for example, they, um, they exhibit a full um, lab uh, from Vienna, a lab of quantum physics. Um, so you visit it a little bit as an artwork. You know, you see weird um, instruments, tools, people in white coats and, uh, and, and black boards, and it seems very impressive. See, so, oh yeah, I don't understand. And something lies behind, and uh, it's a little bit the same. Uh, as in art, in a way, you know, like something, there is something behind, of course, I don't know what, you know, but there is something, and if I research more, I'm sure 
something will, will come out. I don't know. Uh, it's good, but what I regret, what I you know, like, I miss something that. What is good? I mean, the interest uh, for it in, in science is good because it breaks categories. But if you follow that rule or that logic, you know why quantum physics or why hardcore science and the uh, the world, and why not geology? Geology? Why not uh, uh, yodeling? Why not uh, you know like boxing? Why not uh, even science fiction? <coughs> not uh, serious enough. You know? Uh, the right interest. So that's a little bit like the uh, same as in music, you know, it's always like serious music or music that we don't really understand. And uh, so that's a little bit like, uh, I mean, there is seriousness everywhere, I think. And uh, I had this scene like in, in Paris when I started the first, my, my first show. Uh, of course, there was a very serious theory about five billion years and quoting Einstein and the string theory. But at the same time, uh, I had like uh, solo shows. The guy who was not an artist, he was like a, he's like a, uh, a motorbike driver, you know, a, a, a ghost ghost uh, ghost rider. He's he was he's still well, very no, well known on the internet because he rides uh, 200 300 uh, kilometer per hour on the Autobahn in Germany or he became famous to ride around Paris in the peripheric in 12 minutes, I think. So Baron while filming himself. And of course when you see this uh, video, you know, it's, it's totally like fascinating. It's, it's even better than, 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 than art in a way. So this was also in parallel with quantum physics and also I had like a uh, the World Championship of uh, um, Sculpture, Chainsaw Sculpture. So we invited the best uh, chainsaw sculpture in the world. Uh, of course, to all like uh, workers in the wood, you know, like uh, super well uh, equipped and, and super, they, you know, they made amazing, amazing sculpture. Uh, outside Palais de Tokyo, which were considered as an exhibition, uh, as, as serious as the, the main exhibition. I think this is very important, and, and of course, all these examples were brought to me by artists. You know, like for me, like if you consider an artist like Steven Provino, for example, why he's so serious for me, why he's so important, you can like it or not, his painting, but his way of looking at art. Is so open, is so uh, you know like uh, deconstructed out of any category. For example, his his interpretation of minimal art was very interesting because you know like if you if you if you're interested in minimal art, then you, you know you can go uh, in the art of the, of the 40s and 50s and see all the artists and. and Philosophers and sociologists and psychologists and all these people who, you know, like uh, down the road brought minimal art and of the 50s, beginning of the, the 60s. But he said, no, uh, for me, minimal art came out after the war with all the GI who came back of the war and were like so bored because they, they, they were like uh, thrilled during like uh, five years with the high. And, uh, High, uh, like uh, uh, experience, very extreme experience, and they, they got back uh, to their home. They got got bored, and they started to, to want. They wanted to, to have some like uh, exciting uh, experiments. So they started to steal motorbikes, and they started to organize hot rod. The hot rod is a, a, a motorbike. And so you so did like uh, uh, races with this motorbike, and in order to be powerful and efficient, this motorbike, and you remove everything which you don't use, everything you don't need, all the fenders, everything which has uh, a weight. So basically, it's the less weight for maximum power, and you already has you already have a definition of minimal art. And of course, uh, the first uh, minimal artist uh, uh, 
they started they started to make their first painting with uh, Harry Davidson uh, uh, painting. It's, you, you can, you know, there's a, always another way of looking at history, and I think this is interesting. When I mean, you can like it or not, this this uh, interpretation of minimal art, but at least uh, you know, it's always more interesting to look uh, uh, to look uh, outside the box, uh, outside uh, like normal art history, and I think it is important to science because if you look at science. Uh, Nice, it's great, uh, but you should look the same way with the same seriousness uh, at other fields, uh, any kind of field, uh, even if it's like a very bad one, like pop or, or, or MTV or I don't know, like reality shows or uh, anything. Anything is worth, I think it's uh, worth. Uh, uh, being looked at uh, as could be science. I don't know what you think. Yeah, no, it's, it, I think it's really also relevant to what uh, we were saying before that uh, uh, it, they've, like uh, uh, artists or even writers must find ways of relating to like, the, the interesting part of the art and science or literature and science or art and whatever or literature and whatever uh, combine is when uh, neither of the two is just interested in like uh, um, you know, uh, showing off this sort of legitimation of this. I think, that, like, uh, literary examples are very good, uh, perhaps, to also, to, at least for me, to think this through exactly. Like, for instance, a, uh, a Turinist writer like Italo Calvino was, uh, was, is very mm, exemplary in this respect, because uh, he has uh, written a, um, a book like Ticon Zero, that I think uh, many uh, are familiar with, uh, that really has uh, science in its best possible way as, as its object, and it's uh, maybe the closest uh, that approximation that one can get of uh, uh, doing literature with science. And but then he did the same thing with other disciplines as well. He did the, this with the urban geography, with the literature and visibility. He did it with the, and non, there, there was no then there was a genuine interest in that. Even though mm, some of the of the experiments or theories that he comes there were based on are now uh, have been surpassed, but still, it is like a manifestation of scientific thought in literary form. And if you think of the same, like of, of another, like this is perhaps something that is more familiar to the Italian public than to anyone else, but uh, uh, a writer such as um, Paolo Giordano, also from Turin, that recently wrote uh, a book that has had a, a lot of success and that was narratively um, good, like well-written, uh, um, fascinating, such as A Solitudine dei Numeri Primi, when, when you read it, uh, it, it is a, um, a love story, it could be a good or a bad love story, whatever, but the scientific metaphor that's at the base of the title, which is of the prime numbers that, uh, like twin prime numbers that are like uh, um, just one, uh, one, step apart, one number apart, so they will never touch but they will always be close. Like this is a metaphor, and it's a metaphor that uh, has nothing to do with the whole realm of science or mathematics. It's just uh, something that uh, sounds good and that resonates very well with uh, uh, the writer being uh, a physicist that actually was not thought by the writer himself but by an editor. And, and so it's uh, um, so it's not like a problem or a trouble with the book. It's just uh, less just a way of spraying the aura of something or of the discipline uh, uh, around a cultural project in order to. Yeah, I don't know, well, to sound more intriguing or to sound more multidisciplinary. And I feel that it's really a risk uh, sometimes, uh, very recently, often also because, uh, I don't know, it's, it's very strange that this, what you say that now what science has started to become for some artists, this kind of legitimation tool that maybe Foucault and Derrida, the frequency of the use of the term research recently to describe what artists are doing, you know. Uh, I think that until 20 or 30 years ago, who does research, like scientists do research? Uh, now it's almost more you find it more often than than uh, any other physical term to describe what uh, what an artist does. If you say this artist paintings or this artist sculptures, but more often than not in critical texts you will find this artist research. You know, and I think it's a contiguity that has uh, some uh, meaning. Yeah, I think it's important. I was in a talk by John Almeder and he was explaining how in the seventies and eighties. It was important for an artist to find his own style. You know, like you could say, oh, this artist is about that, and this artist is about that. And he took this, um, 
you know, like um, explaining why he started to do something else and why he, his style is so no style in a way. Uh, and I think it's uh, it's important to 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 see about. Uh, so sorry, the, the last uh, I was talking about that. Now I bring this and I said, <laughs> what was the link? Um, about, now I don't remember. Research. About research, uh, thank you. Uh, now it, it's true that an artist, uh, uh, the, the, the importance of the research of an artist uh, is also something you, you ask uh, an artist because he is not about finding a style, finding answers in a way. You know? It's more about uh, uh, finding ways, process of doing things and it's also it's, it's, it's surprising to see also how the, the interpretation of the, the, the process of uh, art critics uh, art criticism uh, you know, got transformed in, in the last decades if you, if you read a text written in the 70s explaining uh, the importance of uh, this uh, artist style, for example, like uh, the stripes of Buran, the, you know, <coughs> the cycle of Mosse, or uh, targets of uh, American artists, and etc. etc. How it also shifts from a way of describing processes at a uh, what an artist is doing. It's also a question of logic. And I think it's very interesting that, uh, thanks to science, in a way, uh, the language we use in art uh, evolved. For example, it's, it's, the, it's, it's accepted now that an artwork could have more than one or two interpretations. Even the more interpretation you have on an artwork, the better it is. Uh, I think uh, it's also a question of logic. You know, like, uh, it's not like uh, this artist is about this style, you know? It's more like this is about that, and that, and that. So it's, a, it's not a logic, uh, it's, it's either stripes or cycle, in a way. You know? It's not like a logic of this or that. It's not like black or white. And nowadays it's accepted that uh, uh, something is about that, and about that, and also about that. And if you think about science, uh, we think mathematics, for example, is like bring one solution. This is right or wrong. But in fact, if you look a little bit further in mathematics, in, like, uh, in the research mathematics, it's clear that uh, an answer is not right or wrong. It's I think what is important for a mathematician is that the answer is, is more useful in this case and less useful in that case, which means there's not like right or wrong answers, that there are, there are some answers that are more useful in certain cases. And this is very important. And also like it breaks a little bit the, the, the way we, we see with the way we see uh, mathematics and science, uh, where we think, you know, like with our classic uh, thinking, that, that science is about right or wrong answers. And I think it goes also uh, both ways. I don't know if it's art that, that told us to look at science in a more poetic way or reverse, but I think it's also nice to see what art could bring to science, because till now I don't think you could say art brought yeah, many important, I don't know, maybe art brought some important <coughs> things to science, but apart this way of looking at science with a more poetic way, uh, I don't know if it's uh, the, the, what we can what we can uh, bring from science is the same as what we can bring from art in the other film. No, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. There is. Uh, uh, I remember some time ago I was uh, um, uh, 
listening to a panel uh, on about art and political activism, and there have been uh, several very long interventions asking exactly the same thing. So, what can art uh, bring to political activism? And uh, like philosophers and artists uh, and critics all uh, discussed a, a lot of length, uh, quoting a lot of Foucault and a lot of Derrida. What art can bring to political activism? And then uh, an activist uh, uh, was scheduled to speak as the last person, and everyone was very tired because it had been an incredibly long panel discussion. And so she. Took like she was also a, like a, a very young woman, she stood up, she was a bit trendy, you know, and said that um, uh, I, as an activist, I know precisely what art can bring to political activism. And she switched on the first slide and it was a blank uh, image and she said nothing, but I really hope it could. <laughs> and I, don't know, I think that this could be a good answer. Yeah, uh, yeah this is a, a good answer, but in a way also, it's a kind of like, it's a very romantic idea that art could bring something to anything. And it, it's a very tricky when I say this because uh, we, can, we, could th we could think that art doesn't bring anything. Of course, I don't think that. But if we think that art could bring something in our way of thinking, that meaning uh, asking an artist uh, his opinion about politics, for example, of course he doesn't have anything to say. And I hope not, because I mean he's not a specialist. He could have like uh, like any anyone uh, an opinion, but of course he won't bring any answers. His his job is not about uh, getting answers. His job is about raising questions. So we wrong we, we ask the wrong thing from an artist, I think. And uh, it's it's like saying that oh art should be I mean. Art should be about politics, you know, because politics nowadays is so important. So I think <coughs> art uh, should give answers, and, and I think uh, this artist is good because he's doing, or this exhibition is good because uh, it's an exhibition about politics, and it's uh, this artist uh, is is, uh, is like uh, doing political art, and I think it's nice to to say to think that way, but I think it's an illusion. First, I think uh, any good art uh, is political. And I think uh, doing, for example, an exhibition about politics is redundant. I mean, if any good art is political, uh, you don't have to do politkunst, as they say in Germany, for example. Uh, why uh, every uh, good work is, is political? Because uh, uh, I think once again we want we don't we don't have to bring answers. We know we know the result of uh, knowing the answers in a political way. It, it's not it's not always uh, it's not always so successful. I mean, if you look at history and all these people who thought having the right answer, maybe it's not uh, the the. the Always the right, uh, the right way to, to, to look at things. Uh, raising questions, uh, I think this is important, not just to raise questions, but I think uh, if you look at art, uh, uh, we were talking about Olivier Mosse, for example. Once I was doing an interview with Olivier Mosse, and he told me if you can look at art as art, then Reality could stay reality, and I was oh, I don't understand. Like it's like some like, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Japanese, uh, 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 they say, you know, like a uh, kind of proverb. But it, it's, it's true. If you can look at art, like for example, like in Olivier uh, Moses, it's like a, a monochrome, for example. If you could look at a monochrome as a monochrome, like a red monochrome, and not as a, something because it's red so it means about politics, about blood, about earth, about uh, I don't know what, uh, just red painting. If you could look at, at, uh, at a monochrome as a monochrome, meaning uh, removed from all the filters, political, um, philosophical, <coughs> psychological filters, then maybe you could, you could see just a simple thing. So if you could do that, then reality could stay reality, meaning 
a reality removed of all its filters, of all the, the, the advertising, of all the, the propaganda, of course it's not possible, but it's a nice way of considering art as a kind of mental hygiene, a kind of like tool that helps you just to say, to see you, uh, you, the reality uh, you are in, just the daily life, removed from all these filters. And I think it's a, it's a great, uh, of course it's, a, it's, like, it's like analytical philosophy, it's, it's like super uh, uh, frustrating. Of course, you know, like you think about philosophy, it brings like all the answers in the world, and so romantic, and seeing Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, existentialism, and humanism, and then you know, cry, it's so nice. But uh, I think if you look at uh, the main uh, what the main tool of uh, the 20th century, which is for me the analytical, analytical philosophy, and you know, like, um, people only, only talk about work. Uh, of course, it's totally frustrating, but at least it's a tool. It's a tool not to, to answer, to give answer, but it's a tool of, in order to, for, for just for anyone to live in the reality they are in. And I think art. Uh, in a way, it's the same. It's frustrating to see art as this, but if you see it as just a tool, mental hygiene, kind of like exercise for yourself, I think it's great. Yeah. <laughs> and you could, like, of course, like, uh, then you don't make any categories because it's, it should, of course, like work for contemporary art, for cinema, for literature, for, for anything. Of course, I think in our contemporary art, uh, I'm interested in contemporary art because uh, for me it's the crossroads of all these uh, researches. Yeah, if I, I would be, um, I think, I think it, it would be very hard to go on from here. <laughs> no, the, um, and I think it's also, um, we have we gone past our time. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. It's like, I think it's about, I don't know if there, there is a possibility of any questions. Uh, uh, if, uh, we spoke about raising questions, so it's, I, I don't know if we did. But uh, at this moment, it's always extremely yeah. embarrassing. <laughs> so we will just. Well, uh, just a, a, a very quick one, because I think you're right, there are very many questions. I don't know what um, earlier on, um, you, you spoke of how to say this. Oh, you're wrong, you sort of, uh, attitude, the attitude, I think it was attitude becomes form. Yeah? Um, and in, in, a, in a lot of the issues discussed, um, is, 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 this, is this not precisely the question, it's an attitude. Um, and, and this is not just a question of contemporary art, um, or fashion, or whatever. How are attitudes uh, created, sort of attitudes between small groups, between larger groups, and whatever, uh, and the question of, of, of how many how many people it takes, what kind of uh, consensus, how big a consensus it makes for, for, for a shared understanding. Um, I worked in Africa for quite a long time, and <coughs> one of the things that I realised there was that magic, in fact, does exist. It does actually work. Um, so it's leading aside questions about what people say about black magic in Torino. Um, I, but it, it does exist because it is, as, as you were saying, believed in. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of very interested in this, and also questions of uh, contemporary art and, uh, and contemporary music, uh, and, and, and sort of di differences between the discourses. As, as you say, I think this is all very, uh, each one can feed the other, and the important thing is to, 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 to have, a, have a series of points if you're looking at something. So what was my question? My question was uh, how much, how much in all of this are we dependent upon attitude and, and, and a shared attitude? Was that a question? I, I don't know. I mean, of course, attitude in the sixties were had a different meaning. Uh, you know, like it, it was like trying to summarize the way uh, the artists are, are working, which was kind of shift from like uh, going out of the studio and, uh, and, and body, a way of, of, doing, uh, of doing things. Uh, the Maya, putting the phone on the floor and, and, and uh, asking the visitor to, to take the telephone.
phone and, and trying to talk with the artist. And of course, it's a, it's a way of going out of the studio and uh, the artist and his own attitude and his own uh, commitment to do, to create uh, the piece uh, was important. Uh, nowadays, I don't know if we, maybe we have another way of looking at attitude. And, and I don't think it's uh, the, you speak about the attitude of an artist and I don't think nowadays it's the same I don't think it creates a form nowadays the attitude of an artist uh, as I see it, I don't know it's, yeah, it's, yeah. More, it's more like a tool for media the attitude of the artist nowadays it's something that not about the creation of a form yeah but I think that what you were saying uh, the attitude is the, the the technical form, but I think that what you're saying is really correct, like uh, about believing. And I think it's also something that you, my colleague, said before that there is something extremely different in the way that in the status of objects and the status of art objects. Like the fact that if I, whether well, the fact that, for instance, if you walk on the in the hallway down there, there's a crack on the in, in the ground, that there's some grass going uh, from it, and it, it's an artwork. The fact that that is an artwork, whereas the grass outside isn't, this is a fact that is true because we believe in it. Uh, like what, what defines this grass inside being an artwork. So I think that, in the, I don't know how many people it takes, how many institutions and like officialization stamps it needs for this to be so, but I think that you really have a point there. And uh, the difference between these two things, I think is also where the, the science point lies, because at least from the way I see that the whole debate also in analytical philosophy about the status of science has specifically been about where in this uh, spectrum uh, to situate the scientific truth. Mm. Yes, about this fourth condition or the fourth element. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 That's it.